And so, uh, fifth lecture out of six, Sean Sayers on Hegel, Markets and Dialectic. Take it away, Sean. Thanks, Paul, and thanks very much for organising these uh, lectures, and thanks to everybody here for attending. I'm very, very um, on, I'm honoured and grateful to have such a good audience. This lecture today is going to be, it's entitled The Actual and the Rational, and it's really a, um, a, a reflection on Hegel's uh, famous words in the, um, uh, the philosophy of right, where he says, what is rational is actual, and what is actual is rational. On this conviction, the plain man, like the philosopher, takes his stand. Well, these words from the preface to Hegel's philosophy of right are among his most notorious and controversial. Ever since their first publication, they've been attacked, ridiculed, and dismissed as implying an extravagant idealism and an uncritical sanctification of the status quo. Hegel himself was surprised by the outraged response to what he calls these simple statements, which he took to be stating views shared by, as he says in the quote I've just read, the plain man and the philosopher. For the most part, he thought the opposition to be based upon simple misunderstandings of his meaning, and sympathetic commentators have by and large agreed. Thus, Hegel is at pains to insist that he distinguishes mere existence from what is actual, and that he is not justifying all that exists as rational. Nor is his philosophy to be equated with any simple sort of subjective idealism. With these points, many commentators have also rested content. There's been a tendency then to greet Hegel's doctrine either with uncomprehending outrage or with uncritical sympathy. Neither response, I shall argue, is adequate. The reactions of outrage are not without their basis, for Hegel's words most certainly have conservative implications, which he welcomed and emphasized. And they also express the extreme idealism of his philosophy. Equally, however, there are profound and important ideas involved in these assertions, which are still of great relevance. It is these upon which I will be focusing. My concern is not primarily with Hegelian scholarship, but with the issues that philosophy is. I will be approaching this in the critical fashion that is necessary for all those who are prepared, as Marx put it, to avow themselves the pupils of that mighty thinker and seek to distinguish the rational kernel from the mystical shell of Hegel's philosophy. <clears throat> when Hegel talks of the rationality of the actual, his first and most general purpose is to specify what he takes to be the scientific attitude. And this is basic, and this is a basic and important element of the rational kernel of his thought. Hegel is saying that actuality which for the moment I shall take to refer to the world in all its aspects, that actuality is orderly in its forms and law-like in its behavior. It is rational in the sense of being regular, coherent, and comprehensible, explicable in rational and scientific terms. Hegel is a strong defender of the realism implicit in the scientific approach. He rejects the Kantian idea that order and necessity are merely our way of seeing things, mere subjective forms that we impose on the world through our use of the categories. On the contrary, Hegel argues, species and kinds, laws and necessities are objective features of reality which science seeks to discover and to understand. Hegel's philosophy is so widely regarded as an extreme form of speculative a priori, even mystical metaphysics, that it may come as a surprise to hear it praised 
for being scientific and realistic. Of course, there are strongly speculative and unscientific aspects to Hegel's thought. But scientific and realistic themes are also present, though less often perceived or appreciated. In particular, philosophy, Hegel insists, should study actuality. The content of Hegel's work is thoroughly realistic to a remarkable and unique degree for a modern philosopher. It covers a truly encyclopedic range of topics treated in a thoroughly concrete and empirically detailed manner. Moreover, Hegel extends this realistic and scientific approach to the study of society. And his work contains a notable defense of the idea of social science. He rejects entirely the Kantian idea that the social world cannot be grasped in scientific terms, but must rather be approached morally and critically, as people say. Philosophy, he insists, and I quote, must be poles apart from an attempt to construct a state as it ought to be. It can only show how the state the ethical universe, is to be understood. To comprehend what is, this is the task of philosophy. By the time Hegel was writing, the scientific attitude had largely prevailed in the study of the natural. But there was, he observes, a great resistance to regarding the social world in this manner. Despite the immense growth of the social sciences since then, this is still true today. The social and the natural realms, it is often argued, are fundamentally distinct and different. The laws of nature are objective. They operate independently of us. And for this reason, they must be accepted as they are and viewed in a scientific and objective manner. Social laws, by contrast, have a subjective aspect they are our product, the creations of human consciousness, will, and reason. To look upon the, hum the human world in purely objective terms is therefore, it is argued, inappropriate and wrong. It is to be passive and acquiescent when an active and critical approach is required. For reason, in relation to the human world, has not only a theoretical, but also a practical one. It can guide action and show us what ought or ought not to be. But Hegel takes direct issue with these Kantian views. It is true, of course, that the human world differs from the natural world and that in it, consciousness, will, and reason can play a constitutive role. Hegel does not deny this and nor does Marx for that matter. However, Hegel rejects the idea that reason is a transcendent and absolute quality which distinguishes mankind from the rest of nature. He rejects the idea of an absolute gulf and divide between these two realms. When Hegel talks of the unity of the actual and the rational, however, it is also vital to see that he is not merely reducing the actual to the rational, or vice versa. The relation between these opposites is conceived as a concrete and dialectical one. And at least in the more uh, rational parts of his work, Hegel is aware that the conflict, as well as the harmony of these opposites, it was Hegel's great achievement, it seems to me, to see human consciousness, will and reason in concrete and dialectical, social, historical, and developmental terms. Practical, moral, and political ideals, he insists, are not the product of a transcendent reason operating a priori, <clears throat> nor are they purely subjective. On the contrary, they are historical products and arise out of and reflect the ethical world, that is to say, uh, social relations, institutions and relations. And he rejects the dualism, which is presupposed by the Kantian philosophy. 
Reason is in the world, says Hegel. It is a social product. It does not need to be brought from outside by the critical philosopher. <clears throat> of course, this is not to say that the scientific approach is necessarily uncritical. However, there's a clear sense in which the scientific attitude involves a measure of acquiescence to reality, or in Hegel's words, reconciliation with it. For being scientific implies that we accept objective conditions and adjust our ideals to them, so that our, our views correctly reflect these conditions, <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, rather than imposing our ideas and ideals upon the world. This is the inherent nature of the th theoretical and scientific attitude. However, it does not at all imply a passive and, or acquiescent attitude to them when it comes to practice. On the contrary, a, the a scientific and true understanding of the world and of its necessities is the essential basis for effective action upon it. To be sure, Will and commitment are also necessary for action, but they are not alone sufficient to ensure success. For this, the will must be guided by thought, by reason. We must understand the situation in which we act and what is and is not possible within it. Conversely, ignorance, ignorance, is the recipe for idle dreaming and for the construction of sterile utopias. The less a person knows, as Hegel says, and I quote, the greater is his tendency to launch out, to, out into all sorts of empty possibilities. Hegel is not denying utopian and critical ideas have played a valuable and important role in social and political thought. He does insist Sean, you're, you're muted. You're, you're muted. You're muted over the last second or so. Just repeat the last two or three sentences. And can I ask everybody to keep muted, please? Yeah, but Sean has to, re to unmute himself. He's still muted. Uh, okay. That's, is that better? Yeah, yeah, just the last couple, the, just the last two or three sentences we missed. But if everybody else can remain muted. Okay, sorry about that. It was my fault. I put my elbow on my mouse. I'll try not to do that. Okay, resume then. Hegel is not denying that utopian and critical ideas have played a valuable and important role in social and political thought. He does insist, however, that if such ideas are to be more than mere wishful dreams, they must reflect and be disciplined by reality. For example, Hegel argues that Plato's Republic, surely one of the greatest of utopian works, is misunderstood if it is regarded simply as an ideal vision of how a society ought to be organized. The Republic is rather Plato's attempt to understand the conditions, the developments, and the problems of the society of his day. It is the attempt to grasp actuality in rational terms. Hegel says, philosophy is the apprehension of the present and actual, not the creation of a beyond. Even Plato's Republic, which passes proverbially as an empty ideal, is in essence nothing but an interpretation of the nature of Greek ethical life. That's Hegel. Hegel then, like Marx, advocates a realistic and scientific approach. And his account of society is historically concrete and dialectical. He rejects the utopian and merely critical attitude as a basis for, for political thought and action. These are important elements of the rational kernel of his notorious principle. 
And yet Hegel's philosophy take, <clears throat> taken as a whole is far from being scientific or realistic. Its detailed contents are set within a philosophical system which purports not merely to understand and explain the world in a scientific fashion, but to rationalize and justify it. It is this which constitutes the mystical shell and which gives rise to the accusations of mysticism and conservatism. These accusations, it seems to me, are quite justified. Hegel is quite explicit, at times almost brutally so, about the conservative and idealizing implications of his philosophy. <clears throat> the recognition of reason in the world, he says, and I quote, is the rational insight which reconciles us to the actual. This is the reconciliation which philosophy affords. Philosophy give, this is that now me again. Philosophy gives not criticism, but what Hegel calls consolation. It teaches us to give up the restless desire to condemn and repudiate the existing order. Thus, when Hegel talks of philosophy reconciling us to the world, he means not only that we should approach the world scientifically and discipline our ideas to reality. He means that we should regard the world as rational in the sense of ideal. The world, Hegel insists, is as it ought to be. The desire to criticize and to change it is the era of youth, he says, which imagines, and I quote, that the world is utterly sunk in wickedness and that the first thing needful is a thorough transformation. The maturer and wiser view, the view, needless to say, embodied in Hegel's philosophy, is that, and I quote, actuality is not so bad and irrational as poor, pure, poor blind or wrong-headed and muddled brain, as would be uh, uh, reformers imagine. And I quote again, the good is radically and really achieved, Hegel says, and our dis discontents are groundless. And again, another quote, all unsatisfied ende endeavor ceases when we recognize that the final purpose of the world is accomplished no less than ever accomplishing itself. For Hegel, then, not only is, the, is actuality rational, but rationality is actual in the sense that it is actualizing itself in the world. Quote, the actual world is as it ought to be. The truly good, the universal divine reason is the power capable of actualizing itself. God governs the world. The actual working out of his government, the carrying out of his plan, is the history of the world. World history then for Hegel is governed by divine providence. It is the realization of God's will on earth. The study of history and politics must take the form then of a justification of God, of a theodicy. There is no place here for criticism, no need for it. But evil from this perspective is a mere subordinate and vanishing moment. And our reconciliation with it is achieved, quote, through the recognition of the positive elements in which that negative element disappears as something subordinate and vanquished. The true ultimate rational and divine purpose has been actualized in the world and evil cannot ultimately prevail against it. That's Hegel. Well, here is the mystical shell of Hegel's philosophy in full measure. That aspect of it, which seeks in Marx's words to transfigure and glorify the existing state of things. It leads to the grossly idealized and almost unrecognizable account of social life, which Hegel gives in his political philosophy. The state is pictured as inherently rational, as the realization of freedom, marriage as a harmonious union based on love, and so forth. It is tempting to try and disregard these themes as 
loose exaggeration and rhetoric on Hegel's part. Unfortunately, this is not possible. These views are, on the contrary, an essential ingredient of his philosophy and of his ideas, constantly reiterated as the ultimate and deepest significance of his thought. As such, they have been taken up and repeated ever since by old, as it were, and conservatively minded Hegelians, who have wanted to legitimate and rationalize the status quo. Uh, old Hegelians, you know, from Bradley's time, uh, F.H. Bradley's time, to uh, Roger Scruton, uh, more recently, sort of argue this way. Now, it's a common view that the conservative and idealizing aspect of Hegel's thought is an inevitable and inescapable outcome of his identification of the actual and the rational. But this is not so. As Hegel himself insisted, and as the young Hegelians were quick to point out, the unity of actuality and reason for Hegel is a dialectical one which includes within it conflict as well as harmony. Although Hegel often tends to take the side of conservatism and reconciliation in his later writings, his philosophy is more complex, more confused and, more, and contradictory, and also more profound and interesting in its practical implications than this suggests. In the Encyclopedia Logica, Hegel repudiated the accusation that he was seeking merely to justify the existing order and to rule out any criticism of it. Who is not acute enough, he asks, to see a great deal in his own surroundings, which is really far from being as it ought to be. The claim then that the actual is rational does not, he insists, mean that whatever exists is rational. Actuality and existence are both technical terms in his logical system. Of the two, existence is the lower grade of being. There are things which exist and yet which lack actuality in, in Hegel's sense. For actuality is, and I quote, the unity of essence and existence, inward and outward. An existing thing is actual only when its existence is in harmony with its essence. <clears throat> quote, when this unity is not present, a thing is not, is not actual, even though it may have acquired existence. A bad state is one which merely exists. A sick body exists too, but it has no genuine reality or actuality. Hegel's idea of actuality is closely associated with his account of truth and usefully understood in relation to it. Truth is commonly regarded as a quality of propositions or ideas, which they possess when they correspond to their object. For Hegel, however, this is merely the concept of correctness, and he distinguishes it from a deeper philosophical sense of truth, which refers to the correspondence of an object with its notion, concept, or idea. He says, and I quote, truth in the deeper sense consists in the identity between objectivity and the notion. It is in this deeper sense of truth, that we speak of a true state or a true work of art. These objects are true if they are as they ought to be, that is, if their reality corresponds to their notion. When thus viewed, the untrue is much the same as to be bad. A bad man is an untrue man. This may sound strange and unfamiliar, but as Hegel points out, there are examples of this usage in ordinary language. He says, thus we speak of a true friend, 
by which we mean a friend whose manner of conduct accords with the notion of friendship. To be rational, actual, true, the objectivity of a thing must thus correspond with its notion, its existence with its essence. It must be a harmonious whole, not infected with contradiction. To be untrue, not fully actual, not fully rational, on the other hand, means, I quote, to be bad, self-discordant. But the bad, to repeat the crucial point, although it lacks actuality, may nonetheless exist. This distinction between actuality and existence puts the Hegelian view that the actual is rational in an entirely new light. Indeed, if, actual, if actuality is taken to refer only to fully rational existence, then Hegel's principle that the actual, the actual is rational becomes true by definition. And this is no doubt part of the reason why Hegel and his followers have tended to brush aside objections to this principle. Once we grasp what Hegel means by actuality, we cannot but agree that the actual is rational. But this is simply a tautology. The problem, however, has only been shifted elsewhere here. Although the actual may be rational, by no, no means all that exists is rational and actual. The question remains of how far this tautological notion of rational actuality is applicable to the existing world around us. On this crucial issue, it seems to me Hegel is ambiguous and unclear. In his political and historical writings, as we have seen, Hegel often tends to suggest that the state and society, as they have developed, and as they in fact exist, are rational and actual. This is the basis of Hegel's conservatism. And it is in these terms that he attacks would-be critics of society. He says, reason is not so impotent as to bring about only the ideal the ought, which supposedly exists in some unknown region beyond reality, or, as is more likely, only as a particular idea in the heads of a few individuals, end quote. In more metaphysical and logical contexts, however, we are told that nothing finite is fully actual or rational. Indeed, Hegel says that, and I quote, God alone is the thorough harmony of notion and reality. All finite things involve an untruth. They have a notion and an existence, but their existence does not meet the requirements of the notion. For this reason, they must perish." End of quote. All finite things, therefore, are contradictory and to that extent irrational. They can be criticized for their untruth. Indeed, because of their contradictoriness, their irrationality and untruth, all finite things are destined to criticize themselves in a practical fashion. They are ultimately doomed to change and to pass away. Quote, finite things are changeable and transient. Existence is associated with them for a season only. The association is neither eternal nor inseparable. Well, this is the dialectical side of Hegel's thought. And it was seized upon by the young Hegelians who saw in it the seeds of a radical and critical philosophy. For if nothing but God is fully actual and fully rational, if everything finite is animated by contradiction and in the process of change, then what, in fact, then what in fact exists is never ideal. One must equally say then, what is actual is irrational. And so for the young Hegelians, the realization of reason is not an established fact, but rather a goal and a task. The world as it is, the existing state of things must be criticized and transformed. Reason must be realized. It must be made actual. Engels, in his useful discussion of these ideas, 
But it's Heine, the po poet, Heinrich Heine, with being among the first to appreciate the critical and revolutionary significance of Hegel's philosophy. Heine expresses this charmingly in an imaginary dialogue that he writes between himself and Hegel, who goes under the title in this dialogue of the king of philosophy. Heine writes, once, when I, put out, when I was put out by the saying, all that exists is rational, he smiled in a peculiar way and observed, it could also mean all that is rational must exist. He looked around hastily, but soon calmed down, for only Heinrich Beer heard what he said. Well, I do not know who Heinrich Beer is, but it is clear that Heine's meaning is that Hegel was himself aware of the ambiguity and the possible revolutionary significance of his philosophy, but that he was afraid to speak it. I don't know whether this is a correct account of Hegel's intentions, and that is unimportant here. What is undoubted is that Hegel's philosophy contains strands and themes which, whether he intended them or not, <coughs> have a critical and revolutionary significance. It is these that were emphasized and developed by the young Hegelians, and by the young Marx. <clears throat> Indeed, one of the clearest statements of this critical interpretation of the Hegelian philosophy is given by Marx uh, very early on in a letter to Arnold Ruger of September 1843. Marx writes, reason has always existed, but not always in a rational form. The critic can therefore take his cue from every existing form of theoretical and practical consciousness. And from this ideal and final goal, implicit in the actual forms of existing reality, he can deduce a true reality. Now, as far as real life is concerned, it is precisely the political state which contains the postulates of reason in all its modern forms, in all its even where it has not been <clears throat> the conscious repository of socialist requirements. But it does not stop there. It consistently assumes that reason has been realized and just as consistently becomes embroiled at every point in a conflict between its ideal vocation and its actually existing premises. Well, that's Marx. This is pure young Hegelian. In the existing political state, Marx is saying, we can discern a contradiction between its ideal vocation and its actual existing form. There is a discrepancy between its notion and its objective existence. To that extent, the state is irrational and untrue and may be criticized as such. Moreover, such criticism, the young Hegelians insisted, does not involve bringing either Kantian a, uh, Kantian a priori or merely subjective ideals and values to bear on reality from outside. The ideals according to which the existing state is to be criticized, on the contrary, are supposed in Hegelian fashion to be the notion of the state, something which is intrinsic to the state, its very essence. Again, Marx puts it memorably. He says, this does not mean that we shall confront the world with new doctrinaire principles and proclaim, here is the truth, on your knees before it. It means that we shall develop for the world new principles from the existing principles of the world. <clears throat> well, this is the young Hegelian critical approach. Like old, old Hegelian conservatism, it derives from themes which are central and essential to Hegel's philosophy. And initially, at least, it seems to offer an attractive alternative. Ultimately, however, it too <coughs> conflicts with the rational, the scientific and realistic side of Hegel's thought and cannot provide, it seems to me, a satisfactory basis for the study of politics or society. 
Indeed, this critical approach represents precisely the sort of utopian and subjective wishful thinking against which Hegel directs his polemics. The existing order is regarded as the imperfect and partial embodiment of the notion or the ideal, which is its real essence, truth, and ultimate destiny. The established order is measured against this ideal and found wanting. The scientific attitude of studying what exists is abandoned and the world is judged and criticized in the light of how it ought to be. Well, I'll illustrate these points with some recent examples. For the young Hegelian approach has not been confined to Hegel, to disciples of the 1840s. It has been an enduring influence and appears in some unexpected places. For example, in the Marxist tradition, and even among the, the hardest of hardliners, you would be horrified by the idea that they had much in common with the early Marx, let alone with Hegel. It is particularly evident in the discussion of what used to be called actually existing socialist societies, like, like, like those um, uh, uh, of the erstwhile Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, Eastern European communist countries. Often it is said that these societies were not genuinely socialist, that they were not true worker states. Of course, they existed in fact, but in true Hegelian terms, what is being said is that they were not as they ought to have been. They did not embody the concept, the notion, the ideal of socialism. They lacked actuality and rationality. Some people now say that since these societies had nothing to do with true socialism, their demise has no implications for Marxism. The manifestly unideal character of such actually existing socialist states was and is, one, it seems to me, one of the major problems of contemporary socialist thought. An all too common response on the left has been to try and evade this problem by discounting these societies as exceptions in the way described. But this is clearly not a satisfactory response. It involves abandoning altogether the scientific approach to history and adopting instead a purely moral one. There can of course be exceptions in history, but when history comes to be almost entirely composed of them, they cease to be exceptions and become the stuff and actuality of history. The idea is then revealed as unreal, utopian, and subjective. Not that this style of thought is any monopoly of the left. One of the stranger products, or at least I used to think so, of the American far right, is a writer called Ayn Rand, who propounds an extreme and simplistic brand of laissez-faire individualism. As I say, I thought she was just a sort of freak and a, and a weirdo, but um, since she's been widely adopted by uh, the current sort of Tory uh, uh, party hierarchy, uh, I'm beginning to wonder about that. Anyway, among her works is a book with the arresting title, Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal. However, the title is designed not simply to capture attention, it accurately reflects the theme of the book. The ideal of capitalism is unknown, she believes, because it has not yet been tried. The essence and the ideal of capitalism is the free market. Capitalism, as it, ex as it has existed for all these centuries, actually existing capitalism, as it were, has never realized this ideal. Laissez faire and the free market have always been restricted and compromised, she thinks, by excessive state interference under the influence of muddled and weak humanitarian do-gooders and socialists. The destructive features of capitalism, the exploitation and poverty, the stagnation, alienation, oppression and misery associated with it, all these are the aberrant products of the mixed economy. Pure capitalism 
the unknown ideal would not be like this. Well, to write history in this way is, of course, absurd. Socialists, however, it seems to me, are in danger of similar absurdities when they reject actually existing socialist societies as exceptions and persist in thinking of socialism as an unknown ideal. It is not the job of history or of the social sciences to criticize or condemn societies according to ideal standards. Rather, they should seek to understand and explain the real world as it has in fact developed. The social sciences, that is to say, must reconcile themselves to the world and avoid what E.H. Carr calls the might have been school of thought. Socialists in particular must confront the real world of socialism and, and come to terms with it rather than dismissing it as an aberration. In saying this, I must stress, I'm not suggesting that they should abandon all criticism and simply endorse everything that has gone under the name of socialism. And I shall now try to show how Marx distinguishes what is rational from what is mystical in Hegel's principle, and on that basis, provide a method which is both scientific and critical. Old Hegelianism seeks to legitimize the existing order, whereas young Hegelianism is dedicated to criticizing it. At first sight, they seem absolute opposites. But as I've shown, they share in common the fact that they both adopt a moral rather than a scientific approach to the world. The basis of this moral approach, moreover, lies in the idealism which both share and which is a central feature of Hegel's metaphysics. As we've seen, Hegel's philosophy involves an extravagant form of idealism. The actual is rational, he thought, because reason, the idea, the ideal, is an active principle expressing and realizing itself in the world. Reason, Hegel says, and I quote, is the soul of the world it inhabits, its imminent principle, its most proper and inward nature, its universal. End of quote. Moreover, all this is given a theological interpretation so that the objective world becomes God's creation and history becomes a theodicy. It is this idealism which gives rise to that paradoxically inverted order so characteristic of Hegel's philosophy. For Hegel, for Hegel, it is reason, the idea, the ideal that comes first, and which then specifies, concretizes, and realizes itself in its particulars. As Seth says, and I quote, I think I may have quoted him on the, to this effect before. Anyway, Seth, the uh, 19th century British Hegelian, says, Hegel's language would justify us in believing that categories take flesh and blood and walk into the air, that logical abstractions can thicken, so to speak, into real existence. Hegel's principle that the actual is rational is often identified as the local, locus and source of his idealism and as such rejected in favor of the dualistic alternative. Indeed, this is what Seth himself goes on to do. It is certainly true that Hegel expresses his idealism through his principle, but we must proceed carefully at this point if we are to disentangle what is scientific and rational from what is mystical and idealistic in it. In particular, it is vital to see that materialism also involves the idea of the unity of actuality and reason. Human reason is nothing transcendent. It is a product of natural and social evolution. For this reason, Marx does not reject or discard Hegel's principle. Rather, as he says, he turns it on his feet, on his feet. To quote well-known words, he says, for Hegel, the life process of the human brain, right. that is the process of thinking, 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 thinking. 
Shall I read that again? I've got echoes in. For Hegel, the life process of the human brain, that is, the process of thinking, which under the name of the idea, he even transforms into an independent subject, is the demiurgos, the creator, the real world. And the real world is only the external phenomenal form of the idea. For me, on the contrary, the idea is nothing else than the material world reflected by the human brain and transformed into forms of thought. For Marx, that is to say, nature and society are not, as with Hegel, the products of reason. On the contrary, reason, ideas and ideals, are the outcome and creations of natural and historical development. And I quote, Mark, well, from Marx and Engels again, the phantoms formed in the human brain are sublimates of their material life process. Morality, religion, metaphysics, all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness thus no longer retain the semblance of independence. Ideas and ideas, ideas and ideals have no autonomy from social life. They are the subjective aspect of actual and existing objective social relations. They are social through and through. <coughs> Marx's materialism then does not involve a denial of the unity of actuality and reason. But it does, as Marx says, invert the Hegelian and idealist interpretation of it. Instead of starting with ideas and ideals and either criticizing or justifying reality in terms of them, Marx begins with social reality and explains ideas and ideals on this basis. And I quote again from Marx, in direct contrast to German philosophy, that's to say Hegelian philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth. Here we ascend, we ascend from earth to heaven. We set out from real active men. And on the basis of their real life process, we demonstrate the development of the ideological reflexes and echoes of this life process. Well, this sort of outlook has been enormously attractive and fruitful as a basis for social theory. However, it may well seem that such a straightforward kind of materialism is a reductive and crude philosophy, which leaves unresolved many of the problems of the relations of reason and reality that I've been raising. In particular, it is said that such a philosophy is unable to do justice to the critical nature of thought. If reason were nothing but a product and a reflection of the established order, then it seems it could neither oppose existing conditions nor be critical of them. In order to acknowledge the critical power of reason, it is argued, reason must be viewed in a dualistic fashion as a force separate and distinct from the world. Marx's materialism, however, is a dialectical form of materialism which is not vulnerable to this argument. To the question, where do critical ideas come from? Marx's response is clear. All ideas are social and historical products. All ideas, in this sense, are ideological. Critical ideas, just like uncritical ones, arise from and reflect social reality. In saying this, Marx does not deny that reason can oppose and criticize the established order. He does, however, insist that when it does so, that is a reflection of the fact that existing conditions are themselves contradictory. He says, and I quote, if theory, theology, philosophy, ethics, and so forth, come into contradiction with existing relations, this can only occur because existing social relations have come into contradiction with existing forces of reduction. Criticism, then, is not the prerogative of thought alone. Opposition, negation, 
and contradiction are in the world. They are features of what is, but nothing concrete and determinate merely is. Nothing is simply and solely positive. Negation and opposition are essentially involved in all things. This is the first lesson of, his, of Hegel's uh, logic, as I've stressed uh, throughout these lectures, and the most vital principle of dialectic in all its forms. Mere positive being is an abstract and empty category. All concrete things are a unity of being and nothing, positive and negative aspects. And these opposites are synthesized in the process of movement and becoming. Everything concrete is contradictory. As Hegel says, we are aware that everything finite, instead of being stable and ultimate, is rather changeable and transient. Marxism is a dialectical philosophy. It rejects the abstract, merely positivistic conception of actuality, according to which what is merely is. It agrees with Hegel when he says, and I quote, the materialized conception, existence stands in the character of something solely positive and quietly abiding with its own limits, within its own limits. But the fact is, mutability lies in the notion of existence, and change is only the manifestation of what it implicitly is. Negation, opposition, and criticism, then, do not need to be brought to the world by the thinking subject from the outside. The social world already contains negative, critical, and contradictory forces within it. Nor is this criticism embodied merely in ideas and ideals. It exists, first of all, in reality. And only later is it apprehended by consciousness and reflected in thought. Thus, <clears throat> Marx insists, <clears throat> in a passage that I've quoted, I think, several times before, he insists that communism for us is not a state of affairs, which is to be established, an ideal to which re reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement, which abolishes the present state of things. Marx then essentially agrees with Hegel with Hegel's view that, and I quote, dialectic is not an activity of subjective thinking applied to some matter externally, but is rather the matter's own soul putting forth its branches and fruit organically. This development of the idea is the proper activity of its rationality. And thinking, as something subjective, merely looks on at it without for its part adding to it any ingredient of its own. To consider a thing rationally means not to bring reason to bear on it from outside, and so to tamper with it, but to find that the object is rational on its own account. What Hegel is here describing, albeit in the alien and metaphysical language, which is so much his own, is nothing other than the scientific method. This approach undoubtedly involves a measure of reconciliation to reality, as we have seen. It involves, as Hegel says, not tampering with the world, not imposing values and ideals upon it, <clears throat> not criticizing it, that's to say, but rather observing and understanding it as it is. However, in Marx's hands, at least, this method by no means entails a conservative attitude or an abrogation of criticism. Marx does not set out to judge capitalism against any pre-established moral values, nor to posit an ideal socialist state of the future. Rather, he attempts to understand and explain in scientific terms the workings of existing capitalist society and the forces for change that are imminent within it. In this way, by exposing, articulating, and analyzing the critical and revolutionary tendencies and forces already at work in the world, and as I've said, imminent in it, Marx provides the most powerful and effective critique of capitalism, the scientific critique. 
Thank you. At the end. <clears throat> okay. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, usual pattern. Please put your hand up via Zoom if you wish to ask a question. Please note questions, comments are not papers from the floor, so to speak. Uh, if you want to use the chat box instead, I will try to insert, but hopefully people will feel they can speak. So we're going to start with Dalimas. Okay. Uh, thank you a lot for this uh, stimulating uh, presentation, uh, uh, Sean. Uh, I would like to ask the following. Uh, in uh, Hegel, in his philosophy of history, says that uh, the developmental process of history leads to freedom, to universalization of freedom. And the rational state in his philosophy of right supposedly achieves the identity of subjective and objective freedom. Now, this provides us with the standard to evaluate any kind of existing state community to the degree to which does universal freedom exist in any particular empirical state. So uh, on that basis, Hegel provides us with a critical standard of evaluation of any kind of actually, not actually, really existing empirical state. Uh, and in that, we can say, we can in introduce Marx uh, and say, since Marx says that capitalist society is based uh, essentially on the universalization of the wage labor form, which is a form of dependency and unfreedom, then according to the Hegelian standard, Capitalist society is not a rational society. It is a society that denies uh, the condition of freedom. Uh, that's that's my point, and I would like also to to stress. Uh, you didn't mention, but you meant it to, to mention it, that there is a distinction between the concept of reality and actuality. In German, is realitat, and the actuality is wirkliche Kai. Okay, so uh, we shouldn't uh, we should distinguish between reality and actuality because they, they have uh, two different senses. Reality is just what you said, mere ex mere existence. Okay, it's a it belongs to the realm of appearance, not to the realm of essence. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, is that, yeah, I mean, I, well, to take the second point first, I mean, I thought I very, you know, went over in some detail um, the Hegelian distinction between existence and actuality, um, you know, and I, you know, and I think that's a very important part of his um, philosophy. So it's, a, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, of course I, I understand that. Uh, and I thought I dealt with that issue at, at some length. To come to your other point, though, which is more substantial, you say, I mean, history is, yes, is the um, progressive realization, according to Hegel, of uh, universal freedom. Um, now, now, what you then went on to say, I think, um, is more questionable. You said that that provides, or universal, the notion of universal freedom, then provides a standard, uh, an ideal by which one can criticize any, any society, any stage of history. Hegel, I mean, I, I think that's more questionable. Um, I, you know, the idea that Hegel has is of a development of a, of a progressive uh, realization of freedom, which starts from almost, you know, I mean, he says in the um, philosophy of history that, you know, it starts with a sort of de despotism uh, in the earlier societies where, you know, only one person is free, there's a gradual development of freedom. And it's very important, I think, to realize, and I believe that this is Marx's view too, that capitalism represents 
a realization of freedom, only a very partial one. I mean, it's, it, it gets rid of the, uh, the uh, barriers and, and uh, ranks and, and privileges of feudal society, and in a sense, makes everyone equal, uh, equal in a formal sense anyway. Uh, it is, you know, it, 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 it uh, removes serfdom and bond labor that exist in feudal in the feudal order and and you know, it makes the um the you know the the, the laborer a, a, a free you know the labor con contract into yeah. a free contract now that as you say it's also a form of a, a more perhaps a, a more sophisticated form of slavery but i mean i think that the hegelian view but i do think that marx shares this is that if you look at the grand sweep of history as it were the whole sort of range of history from the earliest societies to um, modern capitalist society, you do see a progressive development of freedom, which certainly hasn't been fully realized in capitalist society, but is better realized. It is a progress in, in, in respect of freedom with, you know, from pre-capitalist uh, forms of society. That, I believe, is Marx's view, and that, I believe, much more importantly, is the correct view. Yes, but what I'm saying is that this also operates as a kind of critical standard vis-à-vis -vis which you can judge, evaluate the existing state of freedom in any given society. Okay, but I mean, now the question is, I mean, in, in Marx's argument, is he does he have a, a sort of ideal, if you like, of universal freedom, as you said, against which other societies are then judged and, uh, and, and judge according to how well they realize that ideal? That's one way of seeing the Marxist argument. The other way of seeing it, which is what I was recommending in my uh, lecture, is that we see the, the, the standards of, of of social life, of including freedom, that we judge uh, contemporary society as imminent, as emerging out of the conflicts that exist in this society. So that you know, the uh, any it, it's not a matter of some sort of um, uh, ultimate ideal against which all societies are measured, uh, but rather you know, in uh, in in our contemporary uh, society, ideas of the absence of wage slavery, the uh, the uh, free a uh, sort of free association of people, uh, and uh, and uh, so you know people being uh, rewarded according to their uh, to their to their deserts to their labour. Those sorts of ideas are not they're not the ultimate ideals of what a society ought to be like. They're rather the the the, the values which have emerged out of the struggles, the class struggle that's gone on in uh, capitalist society. And those are the ideals, if you like, of the of, of, the, of socialism, which are imminent within capitalism, not, a, not an abstract ideal which against which capitalism is, is measured. Yes, but you need a kind of ideal in order to know whether the historical process and the class struggle leads to this direction. For example, such an idea exists in the Communist Manifesto, when Marx talks about the free development of each one, as of every of one, as a presupposition for the free development of everyone. This but I think idea. that idea is one that's imminent within... Of uh, course, within everything, everything is imminent, but imminence is common, both to Marx and Hegel. So there's, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking and about that. Yeah, but I say what I'm arguing, you may disagree with this, but I'm arguing that the basic principles of Marx's uh, uh, form of crit critique and, uh, and way, of, way of looking at society is the same as Hegel's. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, can, I agree. Can we, can we not have this as a continuous discussion? No, that's right, okay. People waiting. Uh, Ruth. Thank you again for um, for this lecture. I'm sorry I, I didn't somehow know about the earlier ones. Um, I guess what I don't know if that you'll agree with this, but I, it's it's sort of how I see it. So and I think 
it's worth considering that um, when we talk about inverting Hegel, um, I think there's a tendency, how do I wanna put it? Hegel has a problem that Marx doesn't have because Hegel really does think, I mean, at least as I, I, I read him as an actual objective idealist such that there really is a kind of fundamental um, reality that is ideational in some sense and not material fundamentally. And I don't think that Marx has that view. I think that Marx is, is much closer to Aristotle who say allows for um, the notion of, of you know, self-reflecting form, but material things are not, there, there's no pure matter, only as an abstraction, prime matter. Actual things are, are not just matter. And certainly humans aren't just matter. So if you're in that universe, although it's certainly helpful to say, hey, social reality is contradictory. And so what a shock, the ideas that take form in that context may well be contradictory also. But you don't have to say that, um, that the ideational forms are somehow deterministically derived from or caused by some kind of pure material base because that's not the metaphysics. The metaphysics is that human beings are conscious material entities who have a certain capacity, namely a capacity uh, for ideation. Um, so there's a, I guess what I wanna say is there's, at the deepest level, there's a kind of dualism built in to the big metaphysical picture, a, a, a dualistic initial moment with Hegel that I don't see Marx simply reversing. And so I, I think that's really important in terms of escaping what look like uh, the trappings of thought by the constraints of some purely materialistic uh, substrate. And I think that holds both in terms of the relationship of ideology to social structures, but similarly in terms of problems in philosophy of mind, or you know, how is it that our, our ideas aren't don't just reduce to the material body? I, I, I think that's a really important point about Marx that he, like other Aristotelians, doesn't have those problems um, actually because of the deep. Met metaphysical commitments that are not simply a, a, a turning Hegel upside down. Um, but there is, I mean, all right, no, I, I mean, I agree with you about Marx, and I think you put it very, very well indeed. I mean, that, you know, that that uh, a human being is, uh, uh, you know, a material, a material being become conscious. I mean, that's, that, that's precisely right. I think that, that in, I don't, I, what I don't see really is, is that, um, Hegel is, 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 I mean, is, is disagreeing with that. I don't, you know, I don't see what you're suggesting, a sort of um, separate, I mean, how do you put it, a sort of initial uh, ideal uh, uh, ba basis in Hegel, which, is, I mean, I think he, Hegel always believes uh, that the ideal has to be, has to be embodied. I mean, the ideal is simply, uh, again, you know, mat material, uh, or, or, or the idea has to be embodied. There's no, I mean, uh, it's not, you know, there's no separate at any stage in Hegel, any sort of separate uh, ideal or uh, uh, idea uh, uh, operating. I mean, he's, and he, I mean, he, he makes this point in all sorts of ways. I mean, God has got to be in the world. God, God has got to realize himself in the world. The idea has got to, you know, the 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 mere uh, mere idea is is, um, is 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 as a pure abstraction. It's got to be embodied in order to have any reality at all. I, it seems to me that Hegel, as much as Marx, uh, holds those views. The inversion comes somewhere else. I mean, and it's quite difficult, I think, to put one's finger on exactly, you know, 
what the difference then is, if you like, between Hegel and Marx. I've, I mean, at least my Hegel and my Marx are, are difficult to distinguish. Um, but I, th I think it's that, you know, the, the idea, as it, as it were, is the leading force, the, is, is what comes first in Hegel, whereas the material aspect is what is the leading aspect of, of Marx. But it's not that one is ever, is, is ever sort of uh, separated from the other in Hegel any more than in Marx. That's, that would be my view. Okay. William. Oh, hi. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> right, it's, it's just, well, a couple of comments, really. First of all, it seems to me that there is the distinction, surely, between Marx and Hegel is Hegel believes in God. Now, God is a logical God, if there is such a thing. And therefore, the world must be logical as well. So it seems a paradox that everything that, that, that Hegel says it, existence is contradictory and therefore irrational. And there, but however, it's the product of a logical God. Um, so that seems to me to be a contradiction, where, of course, for Marx, that contradiction doesn't exist because the world creates God, not that God creates the world. And that the expression of that in kind of rational laws is an explanation of the movement of the world. And that's what Marx seeks to do. It's a real, in other words, it's a philosophy of reality. Now, the other thing, I mean, so is Hegel, but Hegel obviously posits this idea of God, first of all, um, which of course you, in, you don't actually need once you've said that there's only, only reality. What do you need God for in the first place? Now, the, th the thing is, what, what I'm not clear about or what it seems to me why you do it is this idea that there's something wrong with being moral. Um, because surely, right, Marx is moral. He says that the rate of exploitation, he calls the rate of surplus value. He doesn't pick the word exploitation arbitrarily, does he? He means exploitation is brutal, oppressive, extraction of surplus labor that's what that is it's a highly moral term isn't it exploitation it's not a random um word and it, it seems to me quite obvious that that is a moralistic thing that he objects to the exploitation of the working class by the capitalist class if he didn't he wouldn't have called it exploitation so um that seems to me the first point. Why, why should we say that, that we're not interested in morals? It seems to me we aren't interested in morals. My second point is, I think you'd have a stronger case arguing that the Soviet Union and so on were actually existing socialism if they existed. <laughs> but of course, they don't exist, do they? Because the people who um, defended them, in fact, uh, conspired to overthrow them which rather review, reveals that there was something rotten at the heart of those societies. Um, now, in a sense, I think that's a kind of historical debate, and I'm not sure it really gets us very far. Um, but it seems to me that there, that is, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as Engels said. So if we, if we think that these are socialist states, then how did they collapse in the way that they did? And it seems to me that that is kind of uh, insurmountable. Oh, okay. Let me. You can really raise a lot of issues there. Let me try and go through them, and you may have to remind me of them okay. again. Um, Hegel believes in God, yes, but but the God that Hegel believes in is a very strange uh, God. Um, you know, a God. I mean, a God that's entirely sort of uh, embodied and realized in the world. I mean, mo you know, he was regularly accused of a sort of pantheism. You know, and but I mean, and Lenin. I think very tellingly in his um, uh, brilliant, I think, reading of Hegel in the philosophical notebooks. I mean, Hegel says whenever, I mean, sorry, Lenin says that whenever Hegel talks about God, you can translate, it says nature and uh, get the same result. I mean, he's, he's not, you know, his God is not this sort of transcendent figure uh, ruling the world from above he's absolutely in the world he's imminent he's an imminent god not a transcendent god he's an embodied god and you know when you just have to do a bit of translating here you know but i mean you know what hegel says about god is very interesting if you if you will read it as his account of creation of the of of the whole of 
the world. That's that's what I'd say to that. So you know, don't be too put out by the you know the, the the sort of language that Hegel uses. There's a lot to be you know if you read it carefully. There's a lot to be gained from his views about God. I'm not saying to move on that. Mar you know, of course, I totally agree with you. Marx is a very strongly moral thinker. I absolutely agree with that. And I wasn't saying anything, I think, that would uh, have, have questioned that. Um, what I do think, though, is that the, 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 the moral ideas that Marx has, derive, you know, are, are based materially in, in the society of his time. That's what I was trying to say. They're not sort of, they don't come from any sort of transcendent or a priori source. And that's, you know, that's where um, uh, Marx and I think Hegel too uh, differs from um, Kant and the Kantian tradition. But yes, yes, I agree. He's a, he's a moralist. And the, the, the difficult thing or the important thing, and, you know, is to understand how Marx, the materialist uh, and the social realist, uh, you know, can allow for a critical perspective within his approach. And that's really what I was trying to say. I mean, when I said criticism and trying to explain what Marxist criticism is, that criticism is very largely um, a, a moral criticism. I, I, I entirely agree with that. Okay. Wait a minute, Wait a minute. one more. The US, well, the USSR, I don't know what to, to say about that. I mean, of course, you know, it was overthrown. It collapsed, it was rotten. But that proves that it wasn't, you know, it, I mean, you say it wouldn't, it, it would, if it had been, uh, I mean, I think you were saying exactly the sort of thing that I was criticizing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You were saying if it, if it was really socialist, it wouldn't have collapsed. Well, I'm not sure about that. I think we've got to, as Marxists, try and understand, not simply condemn or, 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 or dismiss the, the Soviet Union as a not socialist as not you know has nothing to do with marxism which very many people on the left do i think the job of marxism is to try and explain and understand what happened in the soviet union why you know why it collapsed what 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 happened there and to try and so to learn the lesson and to try and you know uh, make sure that next time there's a socialist revolution it doesn't create it doesn't uh, omit the errors and and have the fate that the Soviet Union had. I mean, that's what I'd say. And I think to do that, you've got to be, you've got to accept that it, you know, it was entirely within the uh, tradition, it was in the historical tradition of socialism. Lenin was, you know, was not, and, and uh, you know, and the leaders of the Soviet Union were not, uh, they were, they were, they were in the, you know, they were communists in the tradition of communism, trying to apply Marx's ideas. What happened and why it happened is what we have to understand. It's not. There's no point in 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 taking a sort of moral attitude and saying, "Well, this isn't true socialism." We it does nothing to do with Marxism. I think that's a fundamentally wrong approach. Okay, we have at least two more questions. If so, if they can not be too long, Nabosa. Uh, thank you for a very inspiring lecture. Like from former socialist periphery, maybe a contribution to the debate about uh, former socialism. Uh, first to say that as a paleontologist, I would disagree from what I know from Hegel's text that in, uh, in his uh, like system, place of God is a place of natural evolution. This is just a side note. Um, anyway, um, as for uh, uh, socialism, I mean, uh, um, experience here in the former periphery here from former Yugoslavia from Serbia is that in fact uh, um, a really a, a real attempt to bring socialism to existence this is how the formula would be uh, failed because it was too socialist in fact it, on the other hand it was too capitalist as well so when it is about rottening let's be fair in a rottening world and we know where this rottening comes from and where it is the basis of the world system. Uh, the attempt to build uh, at least conceptually healthy, to say opposing world, was impossible, historically impossible, due to the dialectics of uh, world system theory or uh, world uh, uh, global economy. 
that's all. It was too much socialist. It didn't exploit enough to put it in a capitalist terms. It invested too much into people. The socialist societies of Eastern Europe and Russia and uh, Soviet Union developed in 20, 30 years. Development is equal to the development of capitalist societies for two centuries without inbuilt colonial plunder and crime. So just take that into consideration for future estimations and conclusions. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for those points. Um, um, just very briefly about God. I mean, God, yes, Hart, I mean, Hegel doesn't believe in evolution for a start. Um, you know, uh, natural evolution is one of the great um, shortcomings, in my view, of his of his philosophy. I mean, he's pre-Darwinian, um, and he doesn't, uh, you know, uh, he, he simply rules out the idea of natural evolution. So, in some respects, his his notion of God uh, and nature are are deficient. I mean, that's that's certainly true. That's inevitable. Um, but uh, I don't think it really affects the. The, the point that I was making of the of, uh, and of Lenin's point that you know God and nature are sort of almost identical uh, notions in in Hegel's philosophy. On the question of I thought you, your remarks on uh, on uh, you know former socialist society actually existing socialist societies are very interesting too. You know I mean you say they were two they were at one at one at the same time both two socialist and two capitalist and I think you know I mean I'm not this really isn't my you know I haven't studied um this sufficiently really to give you a, what I regard as a sort of very well-founded answer but I think something like that you know you're saying it was it was impossible what they were trying to do sort of socialism they were trying to create given the historical conditions of the time and that's exactly the sort of analysis which is what I'm uh, arguing for not not simply to um, to dismiss them as not not true socialism, but rather to try and understand you know what what they were trying to do and why it, why it failed. I mean that that and so is to learn those lessons and perhaps to be as you suggested more capitalistic next time. I mean that may be. I mean you know what 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 would come out of that analysis. I'm not absolutely certain, but. The, the the approach that you're you know that you were uh, sketching is one that I would very much um, uh, endorse and support because uh, it's in the spirit I think of what I was recommending. A, a sci uh, I mean I don't know the term scientific is sort of rather heavy and overused, but an objective, a, an attempt to understand what has happened uh, and why it happened, rather than simply criticizing and condemning uh, what happened as not proper socialism. I mean, that, that that's what's necessary. That's, I think, what you were doing. <clears throat> okay, Rob. Oh, well, uh, I agree with so much of, of what you said, Sean, but not, I'm afraid, on the Soviet Union. And in particular, that all those who dismiss uh, the Stalinist Soviet Union and his successors as being moralistic in their attitude towards it rather than being scientific. I just think that's a little bit unfair to those of us who take the view that Marx uh, theorised that the fundamental contradiction or a fundamental contradiction was between the proletariat and the ruling class, that uh, the transition from capitalism had to be on the basis of a proletarian revolution in which the working class takes power uh, through its own state. And if you have a state in which the working class does not exercise power, then we have a problem about whether that constitutes some kind of Marxist state, whatever they call themselves. It's just, so I'm not arguing that you should agree with me. I'm sure you don't. It's rather that I don't. I think it's too easy to dismiss those of us who do have a different analysis of the Soviet Union post-Stalin uh, as moralistic rather than scientific in our analysis. Maybe. I mean, I, you know, I, I have to see exactly what um, you're I mean, I'm not necessarily criticizing the views that you've just uh, outlined or your views. I mean, but, you know, I think there, there was a very great tendency when the Soviet Union collapsed um, and even before to say to say simply this is not so, you know, this is not a worker state. This was not socialism. Therefore. We don't, you know, it has no implications 
for Marxism or for the history of the, the uh, socialist movement or the communist movement. And I think that's a disastrous attitude to, to have. It's just like Ayn Rand saying, you know, capitalism has never existed. I mean, that's it's just as ridiculous. Edward. Uh, well, I'm not sure about that, Sean. I mean, Mrs. Mandelstam was not an Ayn Rand, but she said that the Soviet Union was the one state which had... Uh, so you vanished, Edward. But um, what I'd like to do... Sorry, is, can you just repeat that point? Because it, 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 it sort of... Yeah, yeah um, it's not just the Ayn Rands of this world. I mean, Mrs. Mandelstam in her memoirs, and, and she'd seen a lot of suffering... She'd seen her, her, her own husband disappear into the gulag. She'd seen the fate of Arak Martava. She said that it was the one state, Russia was the one state in which the, the government had overcome the workers. At least in the other states, the workers were still struggling, but the Soviet Union really, you know, ended the so, I mean, that's, Edward, that's, you know, I mean, so what? I mean, I would say to that, I mean, I'm not disputing any of that, and that's possibly one... Uh, explanation. Yes, one account, agree with what you. happened in the why Soviet why Union? Happened, why the Soviet Union? I, I agree with you there that we have to have a. But what I'd like to start from, I don't like phrases like the sweep of history. I would start from Nietzsche's second his, meditation on history. When now Nietzsche is not an anti-Hegelian entirely. He is in that piece, but it was he, in Nietzsche who said, who rebuked Schopenhauer for his unintelligent attack on Hegel because he said Hegel is very important for historical thought. And even a materialist like Buchner, sorry, like, like uh, Langer in his history of materialism said that Hegel really set history. I mean, I think he was perhaps over kind, but he said it, say, he set history on a scientific course. But you see, I don't think there is any such thing as a universal history. Or that we have national histories. We may get a universal history eventually, but a universal history would depend on the uh, on the unity of mankind. And I mean, you know, if you say think slave labor has disappeared, tell it to the workers who worked in Qatari on those uh, uh, on those. I don't, yes, I don't. I don't. I mean, I mean, I, I'm not intended to claim that there is such a thing as a universal history. And I mean, I mean, although some, you know, I think it's questionable whether Marx. Uh, wanted to to claim that either. I mean, you know, it's very, you know, it's well, an argument. Not it's, it's, a, well, it's, uh, let me not let a, me finish, a, Edward. Let me finish my sentence. It's often thought that Marx's account of the progression from feudalism to capitalism to socialism applies only to Western Europe. That's a very common view, and I think, for myself, a correct view. It's it's not possible to universalize that to generalize that and when you try to do so to characterize um china for example pre-revolutionary china as a feudal society which was the sort of way marxism was often applied to china is is thoroughly misleading and it had to be really rethought by uh, mao and the makers of the chinese revolution when they came in they had to offer a completely different account of uh, the, you know, the, one of the first things Mao did was to give a, an analysis of the classes in Chinese society, which, you know, which was which, which had to be unique to China, it wasn't it, it? So I don't think I think it's a mistake, though one that many Marxists have made too. But it's a mistake to think that Marxism is a universal theory of history. In this okay, David. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I, I. You know, want to thank Sean Sayers for, you know, holding these lectures and unlocking these massively powerful ideas. I mean, I every lecture you prefaced your comments by wondering why people are, you know, that these are boring, not or at least on the surface these are it may appear to be uninteresting, but these are hugely powerful ideas. But look, I want to make a point here about abstract identity or what Marx called dumb generality. You know, if we hold up a template of what socialism should be or what we think it should be, and then express our out moral outrage and disappointment that how it how it's turned out or how we think it may have turned out in the Soviet Union and China, because that isn't the Hegelian method, that isn't Marx's method. 
of analyzing the external world. I mean, we, we have to start with social relationships when we come, when we uh, attempt to analyze the, the physiognomy of any society. It's a fundamental Marxist principle that we, we need to examine the anatomy of its social relationships. And briefly, if we, if we do that, in the context of the Soviet Union, then we are looking at a society that was from the start struggling for its development under extreme um, pressure and encir encirclement from the imperialist countries. Um, and uh, which set in train because of the isolation of that country, its bureaucratic degeneration. Look, Stalin and the bureaucracy that Stalin personified were not a ruling class. They were not a class in the Marxist sense. They were a caste, a parasitic caste um, that leached off the social relations that nonetheless developed in the Soviet Union, but they were not a new ruling class as some, as some tendencies upon the left have been, have, 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 have claimed and theorized over, over, over many years. So uh, I think that, you know, we need, sorry, Paul, I, let me bring this to a close. So I, I think we, we need to be very careful about this. I think that the, what Hegel called abstract identity and the, the pitfalls of making analyses on this basis is, is the weakness of people that argue that uh, the Soviet Union was a state capitalist society and was never worth defending. Look, last point. The Stalinist degeneration of the Soviet Union took place. Let's not forget the purges. Let's not forget the decimation and the destruction of the, of the Bolshevik party. You know, the terror, the great terror of the Moscow trials. Leninism and Bolshevism was destroyed in the Soviet Union. That was the prerequisite, the precondition for the rise of Stalinism and the Stalinist bureaucracy. Okay. Well, I mean, if I can just write very briefly, I mean, first of all, thank you for your very kind words at the beginning there. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether I'd entirely, I don't think I would entirely agree with your uh, analysis of the Soviet Union, but I think it, this is a sort of discussion that's got to take place. I mean, one's got to try and understand what happened, why it happened, without denying the realities. That, that, and in philo purely philosophical terms, what I'm arguing for essentially is a Hegelian as opposed to a Kantian moralistic approach. I think that, you know, as I was, I mean, that was the theme of my lecture, really. The, the you know, the sort of hidden enemy there was, was a sort of Kantianism, which is very, very prevalent, both on the left and in philosophy more generally. Ruth, very briefly, please. Ruth? You're, you're, you're muted. Ruth. Sorry. <laughs> I said I won't weigh in on the former <laughs> Soviet Union, um, though it's a time warp to be <laughs> in the middle of an argument <laughs> about it. Um, or on the Marx and morality, though, it's something I've written about. But I, I wanted to just come back um, to this, to the ostensible problem of how, if Marx is right, how do we have critical thought in any given context? Um, and I think that, I mean, as an aside, I, I, what I want to say is like, even if, even if you, uh, even if we set Hegel aside, <laughs> um, I think there's a problem uh, driven as much by the, um, hegemony of modern British empiricism <laughs> as anything. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem of assuming that what Marx, uh, Marx and Marxists think as a matter of metaphysics is that there's some kind of purely material phenomenon which then somehow deterministically or not gives rise to ideational phenomena. And what I wanna say is that 
uh, you might read Hegel as thinking not just God is nature, but nature is God. <laughs> and therefore there's a kind of pure ideational moment in the metaphysics. But even if you don't, and you say Hegel's totally integrated, you still get the problem that when it's translated into the Marxist register, the default, I, th I believe, is to assume that we've now got a problem. How is thought going to escape the, the deterministic or even not deterministic um, pure materiality? And what I want to say is that um, a perfectly Marx-friendly neo-Aristotelian metaphysics, which I think Marx himself holds to actually when he's not talking about deformed contexts like capitalism, makes that problem go away, right? Whether it's at the level of the individual, we don't have a physical body that somehow we have to explain mental properties. How does that happen? We don't have pure really physical social reality that constrains our thoughts and how do we then have ones that are different from the shape of the society. The presumptive metaphysics is an integrated uh, materialist, it's materialist, but it's integrated in a way that what we have are relationships composed of but exceeding uh, individual, you know, at, at some, at least some relationships are composed of individuals who are conscious material entities. So there's consciousness all the way down. I just think that- I, so I totally, I, I think I've been used that phrase in my, ne my next lecture is entirely about this. Right. And I completely agree with you. Yeah, and I'm not so much talking to uh, um, you. But I just, dis I, what I disagree with you about is you're thinking that Hegel isn't, isn't on the same page here. It's fine if he is. It's more a general point to Marxists who then, who yeah. then, if you read Hegel that way, that's fine. But then that means that when you invert Hegel, whatever that's going to mean, what you're not doing is saying, now we have matter and somehow thought comes out of it. I completely agree with that. And I hope that you, you'll you come to my next lecture and see whether you agree with Because uh, I really am ad ad addressing these issues next, next yeah. on the day. Okay.